Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 6, 2015, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. DeSantis, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to discuss the situation with Iran. President Obama recently said that criticism of the concessions that his administration is making to Iran quote, needs to stop. Well, I disagree. We in this body have a responsibility to speak the truth and to stop a dangerous deal. Take a step back a little bit from some of the recent hubbubaloo about whether Iran has the same understanding of the deal uh, as the United States does. It's true. If you listen to the Ayatollah, he basically said the deal represents complete surrender on everything from day one. And the administration, when they put out their fact sheet, what they put out was different. Here's, I think, a fundamental problem with this. Even if you take the administration's talking point as the meeting of the minds, even if you assume that that will be written down and memorialized, and even assume that Iran keeps the various components of the deal, the fact of the matter is this. This framework provides international legitimacy for Iran's nuclear infrastructure, and it allows Iran to use advanced centrifuges immediately. Now, that was something that just a few years ago was thought to be totally outside the realm of what was acceptable. I think the thought amongst U.S. policymakers, going back several administrations, as well as other friendly countries, where, where look, this is a theocratic, jihadist regime in the Middle East that is sitting on centuries worth of oil and gas. They don't need nuclear power uh, for, for peaceful purposes, certainly, and so why would we allow them to pursue a, a nuclear program knowing the ideology of the regime, knowing the threats that they have made to Israel and to the United States? Of course they don't get a nuclear program, and yet under this framework, their nuclear infrastructure is legitimized. The sanctions relief that we're talking about is worth billions and billions of dollars to Iran. It will give Iran additional lifeblood to foment jihad and to expand its influence in the Middle East and beyond. And so just know, I mean, even if you were somehow getting them to dismantle their nuclear program, uh, when you talk about the leading state sponsor of terrorism, any sanctions relief they get it's not going to go to benefit the Iranian people. That's going to be plowed in to Iran doing dastardly deeds. It's interesting when you talk about the sanctions, and I know the Ayatollah said, look, the sanctions are gone. As soon as that agreement's signed, they're gone. The administration says, oh, no, you know, we'll, we'll get rid of the sanctions as Iran complies, and if Iran cheats, we'll snap back the sanctions. The problem is, is that is extremely unlikely because what is going to be done are the international sanctions are going to be relaxed. If down the road Iran cheats, the idea that you're going to be able to snap your fingers and get all these other countries on board to be able to reimpose sanctions is really a fantasy. In fact, just today brought news that Russia is resuming sales of the S-30 missile system to Iran. That would have been something that they had stopped years ago. Uh, that is going to be business for, for Russia. It's going to be something that's going to be a huge boon to Iran in terms of protecting its nuclear uh, infrastructure from a potential attack. Um, it's also interesting, you know, Russia is the country that is supposed to store Iran's uranium. Um, and yet here they are doing business. So I think it's going to be very difficult to snap back international sanctions. If you were going to use sanctions in that way, the sanctions that you would want, you'd want to come to Congress and say, hey, Congress, you relieve sanctions. They're going to do this. If they don't do it, then you snap back because they know the Congress will reimpose the sanctions, and we're eager to do that even right now. Um, you're not going to snap back international sanctions. And so I think Iran understands that, and I think they know that once those sanctions are removed, that is going to be a continual lifeblood to them, um, and they, they will be able uh, to cheat on the agreement if they think that's what's in their best interest. I think one of the troubling aspects of this deal, this framework, is that the president himself, you know, a year and a half ago, he laid down some red lines. He said, we know certain things 
need to be true in an agreement. Iran does not need to have an underground fortified facility like at Fordo. He said they don't need a heavy water reactor like they have at Iraq. Um, and he said they don't need any type of advanced centrifuges if they're going to have a peaceful program. But if you look under the announced framework, uh, even if what the administration says is true, Fordo lives on. They say it's going to be a nuclear research facility. I'm not sure why you need to have a nuclear research facility fortified underground to prevent uh, an airstrike uh, if you're just doing peaceful research. Uh, Iraq will still be there as a heavy water reactor, and of course Iran will have thousands of centrifuges. These are centrifuges that are not necessary to have a peaceful program. Uh, so those are red lines that were laid down and that have been crossed. The military sites, is there going to be any unfettered access to Iran's military sites? I think the, the answer seems to be absolutely not. Uh, certainly what Iran has said, that is totally out of the question from their perspective, but it's not even clear under the administration's framework whether those military sites will be sites that inspectors can access. And we know that in the past, in 2002, the only reason we were able to figure out that they were doing uh, nuclear work at one of their military sites is because Iranian opposition forces or, or folks uh, who are opposed to the regime uh, filled us in. But that was not something that any inspectors had access to. I think another really significant flaw in the deal is that Let's just say Iran looks at it and says, well, if we cheat, maybe they'll reimpose sanctions. We think it's unlikely, but we just we, we don't want to kind of take that risk. They have an incentive, if they want the bomb, to keep the deal. Because after 10 to 13 year period, everything is going to be gone. And so if they keep the deal, given the amount of nuclear infrastructure they're allowed to keep, they are going to be able to build a bomb at the end of that 10 or 13 year period. Um, and that is totally uh, outside the realm of what is ever thought to be acceptable. Here you have a country that's very patient. Uh, they have a very, very serious ideology that they're hell bent on pursuing. And if they have to wait 10 years before they're able to acquire a bomb, they may make that calculation, hey, we'll just keep the deal and we're gonna be home free. And I think the longer that that happens, I think you're going to be in a situation where uh, that may make a lot of sense for them. And I think the international community uh, will be much less inclined to want to do anything at the end of that 10 or 13 year period. Um, and it's interesting to me just looking at how this has unfolded. When the Ayatollah goes out and says, death to America, we're not going to make any concessions, all this. President's asked by the press, well, the Ayatollah is out there saying that. He's like, well, look, he's got his hardliners. He's got to pacify. We're not really worried about that. That's just for domestic political consumption. It's interesting because when Prime Minister Netanyahu was in a political campaign and he made a comment about the infeasibility of a two-state solution given the situation in the Middle East, uh, the administration really hung that on him. And they said, oh, he, he said it. We're going to have to reevaluate our posture at the United Nations. We may go international to try to uh, impose some type of two-state settlement on this situation. Uh, and there, they were absolutely not willing to cut Prime Minister Netanyahu any slack. So they cut the Ayatollah of Iran, uh, a guy that has a lot of American blood on his hands, more slack than they will cut the Prime Minister of Israel. And that, to me, is just extremely frustrating. I, I think that when you hear people who will defend the framework, they'll say, either you support this framework or you want a major war. Uh, and I think that that's um, a straw man, uh, but I think that it's a straw man just simply more than the fact that a lot of people think that there are things we could do to get a better deal. But put that aside, a bad deal makes more more likely. Because what you're going to see are countries in the Middle East react to Iran building a bomb, react to Iran's designs for the region. We see Iran, they're the leading patron of Hezbollah in Lebanon, Assad in Syria, the Hamas terrorists in the Gaza Strip, the Houthis in Yemen, and of course the Shiite militias in Baghdad and in other parts of Shiite Iraq. Uh, People see that. These Sunni regimes see that. 
um, and they are going to respond, and you will end up with a potentially catastrophic arms race in the most volatile region in the world. Final point I would just make, and I have some, uh, some of my, my colleagues here, and, and we wanted to get some folks here who had served the country in uniform, uh, served in the Iraq or Afghanistan campaigns. And um, the reason is, is because I think that anyone who served in those conflicts knows that, at least I can say for Iraq, uh, probably the number one source of deaths uh, for U.S. service members in Iraq uh, came at the hands of Iranian-backed groups. Um, maybe not the most. I mean, prob it was probably pretty close. Certainly hundreds of deaths, maybe as many as 1,500 deaths uh, for groups that would explode these huge EFP bombs that would, that would maim and kill uh, indiscriminately. And um, they were never really held to account for that. Uh, that brought a lot of uh, um, uh, anguish to a lot of American families who don't have their loved ones coming home um, as a result of that despicable regime. So this is not a regime that wants to be part of uh, a good neighbor. They don't want to be part of, of, a, of a peaceful international order. It's a regime dedicated to the ideology of jihad, um, and they have proven time and time again that they are interested and that they are willing uh, to kill Americans with impunity.